Hey, what's up, rattlers? So, in a previous video from here in Thailand, I was talking about the five different types of rat snakes that are found here in Thailand. And of those, one of my favorites, I would have to say, is the beauty snakes. And of the beauty snakes, my favorite is the cave dwelling rat snake. It is such a unique snake, and not a lot of people are aware of where this snake even lives, let alone how to take care of it. So, today is going to be an awesome adventure because I'm going to go up into the cave system systems that these snakes live their entire lives in to see exactly how the cave dwelling rat snake is living out here in the wild in Thailand. I'm Dave Kaufman and I tour the world to see how reptiles are living in the wild. And while I'm at it, checking out some of the most amazing facilities and reptile expos as well. It's all about learning, appreciation and conservation. So come with me and join my reptile adventures. At Zilla, we are dedicated to the innovation of caging, lighting, and equipment solutions that provide proper husbandry for your pet's long and happy life. To see our entire catalog, visit ZillaRules.com. So right now I'm still down in Southwest Thailand and I'm well within the range of the cave dwelling rat snake. And sometimes they're just known by their scientific names as Ridley Eye. However, they live in limestone caves that are way up in the mountains and I don't really feel like climbing a mountain so I'd rather take a boat. So 36 years ago, they built a hydroelectric dam in this area and the canyon filled in with all this water forming a reservoir unfortunately in the process killing millions of animals that lived in the canyon but it formed this reservoir and the mountains that you see on the edge of the reservoir they're the mountain tops actually and so taking a boat to the edge of these mountain tops is an easier way to get to the caves at the top of these mountains All right, Rattler, so we're at the spot and now it's about a 25 minute hike straight up this mountain <laughs> until we're at the cave where the snakes live. Okay, Rattlers, this is straight up this mountainside. It's like 98, 99 degrees out here and about 50% humidity. So the humidity isn't killing me, but the hot temperatures are. But this is literally straight up this mountain to get to this cave. And I, as you can tell, am in perfect shape. Listen to that, Rattlers. The gibbons out there are welcoming us to the cave. We're almost there. Oh, look at that. Holy crap. <laughs> this was worth the climb. Amazing. Oh, wow. All right, Rattlers, after 25 minutes hiking up that really steep mountainside, we have arrived at the cave. So look at the ground in this cave. It's smooth and it doesn't look like rock because that is guano. That is bat crap from all the bats in this cave. And it's compact and in it are worms that are eating it. 
And so we have to watch out because the bat crap and the worms make it incredibly slippery in here down to that slope down there. Look at the scope of this cave. And you can hear the bats. So we're deep inside the cave now and even though I'm still sweating profusely, it's like noticeably cooler. It's probably 25 degrees cooler in the cave than it is outside the cave. So we're gonna go deeper into this cave until we find the Ridley Eye. So look at this, this is a, a lake in here and that's not mud, that's bat guano. All right, we gotta find a different direction here. Mm -hmm. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. I almost just fell to my death. It'd be really nice if one just shows up right away. <laughs> and there he is. There he is. There he is, Rattlers. He's sitting right on top of the stalagmite. So stalagmites come up from the ground. Stalactites come from the ceiling of the cave. So he's hanging right on this stalagmite and he's really high up there. I don't know if we can get him down, but at least we found one here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The baby on the Whip back. scorpions. Uh, on the back is a oh bull of baby, you see? Look at the size of this spider. So this is called a cave hunter and yes. she has an egg sack with her. This cave is amazing. And look at this. There's the tiniest little millipede here. Guys, we haven't been in this cave for more than five minutes, but look at this. This is the second Ridley Eye that we have found here, and I was so worried about coming all the way up to this cave and not being able to find one, but the way that this trip is going, of course we found two in five minutes, so I'm gonna get him out of this little cubby hole here. He's hissing a little bit, come on, buddy. All right, so now the first thing that he's gonna do is he's gonna musk me, and he just did that, and it stinks, but I'm gonna put him up here so he feels a little bit more secure. And it's really dark in this cave and I can't really see where his head is, but I may get bit. But look at the way that he is making his head look as big as possible. And where cobras hood out horizontally, this guy hoods out vertically to make his head and his body look as big as possible. Whoa, 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 whoa. But I'm getting musk all over me. But these guys are making a really good living inside this cave and they are specialized bat eaters. And what these guys will do is they will hang by their tails from the stalactites. And when the bats fly in the early morning and in the evening, these guys snatch them right out of the air. Easy girl, easy, easy. These are perfectly adapted cave dwellers, hence the name Cave Dwelling Rat Snake. And this guy, this guy is my lifer, but take a look at those muted colors that he has. He doesn't need a lot of color because it's perma-dark in this cave, but I'm sure historically, before this subspecies entered these caves and started learning how to make a living in these caves, they were much more boldly patterned because they needed that camouflage out in the forest. But once they came into this cave, they started losing that coloration, and now they're almost ghost-like coloration. This is such a beautiful snake, and again, this is my favorite of all the beauty snakes. Wow, and let me tell you something guys, that musk really stinks. It is a tangy, pungent musk, and I've never smelled snake musk like this before. It really has a unique musk. Isn't that funny that we get to the point where we can start rating snakes by their musk? He's actually well behaved for a wild beauty snake. Usually these guys open their mouth and are snappy and bitey, but this guy, he just doesn't seem too alarmed that I'm holding him. And I can almost guarantee I'm the first human that has ever picked up this snake. And he doesn't seem alarmed at all. But a lot of that is the way that I'm holding this snake. I'm not grabbing him behind the head. I'm letting him just freely kind of crawl over my arms and hands. He doesn't feel threatened by me holding him in this way. I'm not grabbing him and holding him against his will. So he doesn't feel as threatened as he would if I tried to grab him behind the head and 
make him believe that he was about to be eaten. So again, it is completely pitch black in this cave. There is no daylight, there is no night, there's no light cycles, there's no ultraviolet radiation that gets into this cave. So this snake is perfectly suited for life in complete darkness. It really doesn't need its eyes. It has an acute sense of smell that it uses to actually taste the air with its tongue. And that's how it can zap those bats and birds right out of the sky. But if you have captive bred specimens of this particular subspecies, if there was ever a snake that was perfectly suited for life in a rack system, this is that snake. But wild caught snakes like this one belong right in this cave right here in Thailand. And there are plenty of people that are working with this species that if you want to work with this species, there are plenty of captive bred specimens out there. We no longer need to take these snakes out of the wild for any reason any longer. But man, this is like a dream come true, coming to a cave like this in Thailand to find this snake. But right now, I'm not gonna handle her any longer and stress her out any more than I have to. I'm gonna put her right back in that little cubby hole where we found her. And that is how we find a cave-dwelling rat snake. So the cave-dwelling rat snakes in this cave are eating quite well. Just listen to all those bats back there. There are literally thousands and thousands of bats right here in this cave. So again, these rat snakes are specialized at eating these bats, but the captive bred ones will readily eat frozen thawed mice with no problem off of tongs. You don't need to go out and find a bat breeder to feed cave dwelling rat snakes in our domestic situations. They will readily eat frozen thawed mice just like any other rat snake. They're very easy to care for. All right, so let's take a temperature read in this cave here. So the humidity in this cave is 88% relative humidity, and it's 26 degrees Celsius, which is 79 degrees. So it's much cooler in this cave than it is outside this cave. And this is the constant temperature day and night that these rat snakes are living in. But pay close attention to that relative humidity of 87 to 88% relative humidity. These snakes need really high humidity. So the temperature in this cave does not fluctuate day or night. It is a constant temperature in this cave. And the humidity is a constant humidity in this cave because of all the guano increasing that humidity. So keeping them in a rack system with you know, cocoa block substrate that can hold in that humidity and increase that humidity in the tub is gonna be very beneficial to keeping these snakes. All right, Rattler, so right up there hanging from those stalactites is yet another Ridley eye. This one is big, but he's way on the roof of the cave. We're not gonna be able to get him out there, but that's three of them within about 10, 15 minutes. This is absolutely amazing in here. There's the way out. All right, Rattlers, so unfortunately we can't spend that much time in this cave because there is so much guano that the air quality is actually toxic in here. So we can only spend about an hour to an hour and a half and already I can feel my lungs kind of burning because I've been breathing in all of that really toxic air from all the bat excrement in this cave. But man, I would have loved to have spent more time looking through this cave, but I gotta get out of this cave and go give my lungs a rest and breathe in some fresh air. It really is this toxic, pungent air in here that these snakes are living in that I just simply can't stay in here any longer because as you can tell, my throat is getting raw and I'm losing breath by the second. So I've got to make my way up towards this entrance and get some air, but this was one of the most incredible reptile adventures of my life to come to this habitat, this such a unique habitat of the cave dwelling rat snake and actually finding them in their habitat. That was simply amazing. Woo! And again, I wish we could spend more time here, but I am going to go up this cliff right here and try not to slip on all the guano. <coughs> yeah, I can actually feel my lungs starting to burn. That is some very toxic air in there. 
I can actually feel it in my lungs that they're starting to burn. Well, they're not starting to, they are burning. Whew. Okay, back down the mountain we go. Rattlers, I'll tell you, getting down off this mountain is a lot easier than getting up this mountain. I can already feel my lungs starting to kind of not burn as badly anymore as they were back there. But, you know, Dan has a lot more experience breeding not only Ridley Eye, but all of the beauty rat snakes. So I'm going to ask him to give us some pointers on how he breeds not only the Ridley Eye, but all the beauty rat snakes as soon as we get down off this mountain. So Dan, you have more experience than I do with breeding beauty rat snakes, especially the Ridley Eye, the cave dwelling rat snake. So it's not like other colubrids where you give them a cool down period in order to stimulate breeding. It's a little different with these guys because there is no cool down period for these in the wild. So can you give us a few tips on how you are breeding these snakes? I get asked a lot, um, what temperature do you cool all this stuff down to? And I do food cycling. I don't do temperature cycling. I mean, look where we're at. It doesn't get cold here. Why would you do that? Right. And beauty rat snakes, I've never seen one outside of a cave. Temperatures inside the cave they're not really going to fluctuate that much. Right. Even when, even if it does get cold outside, it's not going to change inside. So I just do food cycling. Um, I try to always keep my males lean and mean. And uh, the females, I will withhold food or quantities of food. And then I, I'm, I'm real touchy-feely. So I'm feeling for follicles on the females that tells me exactly what's going on. I don't need a fancy hospital grade machine to do that I just use these fingers right right and I just feel for follicles and when I feel that follicle development I start hammering the female with food and I start putting the male in if I don't feel the follicle development I'll just start feeding them heavy the female and just start pairing and separating and pairing and separating and just go on and on and on like that food cycling is the thing to me that triggers almost all reptiles that it gets them into reproductive mode. Right, absolutely. So, yeah, there's no cool down period. There's no temperature fluctuations out here. Right. And so it's all about, you know, food cycles. And there really yeah. are no light cycles either in a cave. No, so it's you can't really, black. <laughs> right, so you can't really even use light cycles as a stimulant to get them to breathe. So. Right. Right. All right. Well, very cool. Well, Rattlers, I really wish that I could have spent more time in that cave exploring how these really amazing snakes are living out here in the wild. But, you know, we were warned that we could only spend about an hour, hour and a half looking through that cave. And there's a point to where it just drops off into a 40 foot drop. And yeah, I mean, it's really hazardous to go into those kinds of environments, especially when all you have is a flashlight, you don't have respirators, you don't have masks on. You know, I really felt that in my lungs. But, you know, in researching this video and in researching the cave dwelling rat snake, I've discovered that there's no care sheets really whatsoever about this really amazing species and I think that if more people knew how to care for them then this species would be so much more popular than it is. But if you're going to work with this really awesome species and you're going to keep them in a rack system just make sure that you're keeping that humidity higher than you would other colubrids. And again you can use cocoa blocks from Freedom Breeder, you can use sphagnum moss, you can use both. Whatever you can use for a substrate that will hold in that humidity to that upper 80s, lower 90s is going to be ideal for keeping this species. And also, all of them were found hanging from the stalactites. Not one of them, as you can see, was on the ground itself. And so therefore, if you're going to keep them in a rack system, keep them in big tubs and then put things for them to crawl on and get off of that substrate. Anyway, Rattlers, there's more to come from my adventures here in Thailand. So as always, hit that subscribe button when you do hit that bell so you never miss an upload. Check out our sponsors. Their links are in the description below. And until the next reptile adventure from here in Thailand, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle on. <laughs>